What's going on, everyone? And welcome to Method in the Madness. This is the podcast that not only delves deep into design and creativity, but also leadership, productivity, and all things personal development. And we are at episode 15, where I get to sit down with a gentleman called Chris Baker, who is the general manager at Keep Cup. And for those who those for those of you, sorry, who don't know what Keep Cup is, they make very nice reusable coffee cups that were one of the first, if not the first actually, that were perfectly sized for baristas as well. Uh, and Chris very kindly took some time out of his day while I was in London to come on the show and we had a fantastic chat and could have easily been like a three hour podcast to be honest, but we managed to keep it somewhat succinct. But Chris, you know, tells us about his journey to Keep Cup and where his interest in sustainability come from, originally being a packaging technologist for the Crafts Group. He then also tells us the Keep Cup story, which is basically starting out as a local solution to a single-use coffee problem over in Australia, to moving up and eventually basically defining the entire category of reusable coffee cups. We also discuss what it means to be a responsible business and how it differs from a sustainable one and how Keep Cup try to champion that. And then we also talk about jobs to be done theory, which is pretty interesting, and how it could potentially be applied to the single-use coffee cup problem and the convenience problem as well. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Dinghy. And if you're wondering what Dinghy is, Dinghy is insurance for freelancers by freelancers. And they're on a mission to make insurance cheaper, faster, and most importantly, fairer. Their groundbreaking approach offers flexible, pay-as-you-go business insurance exclusively for freelancers, which is all done through their simple and very nicely designed app. And with that, you get insurance that can be turned up or down, on or off, 24-7, meaning that you actually only pay for the coverage that you need and use. You're charged down to the second and it's billed in arrears, which is very handy. And there's absolutely no fees or admin charges ever. And you can also get a quote within 40 seconds and a policy within two minutes just by answering eight very simple questions. And if my brain can cope with that, then anyone's brain can cope with that. It's super simple to do. Um, Their insurance is also not only just tailored specifically for freelancers, but Dinghy also support freelancer groups and charities with the aim of improving freelancing and the world of freelancing in general. So visit the following link today and you can get your quote in seconds. So please head over to getdinghy.com forward slash M-I-T-M. That's G-E-T-D-I-N-G-H-Y dot com forward slash M-I-T-M. There are a fantastic bunch of people over there. It's a super simple service, very simple, and it's not just for creatives either. Any freelancers can get a quote as well. So by all means, please check it out. And now, without much further ado, please welcome Chris Baker to Method in the Madness. Thank you very much for coming on the show, mate. I really appreciate it. And thank you for taking the time out your morning to come to Shoreditch and meet me to do a podcast of all things. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Uh, I was actually really excited to kind of get you on the show and hear more about Keep Cup as not only uh, am I a big fan, but we're a big fan in the Signal offices as well. Um, we have absolutely tons of them in the cupboards at Signal. But uh, just to kind of kick off, you used to work as a packaging technologist, I believe, could you tell us a little bit about, more about what a packaging technologist actually does? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess if you go right back, I, I studied in engineering and design, and I guess at the time figured I'm going to go into designing something great that's going to change the world, and that's how I'm going to make my fortune. And it was sort of then going into that third year of university. I was at Loughborough University, you know, those placement years. Yeah. And all these organizations, they come onto site and they're, they're pitching themselves to you and, and, and what the potential roles were. And I went to, like, strangely enough, the, the entire reason I ended up at Kraft Foods, where I was a packaging engineer or packaging technologist, um, was pure chance somebody said to me there's a free indian buffet at this craft foods um, <laughs> seminar do you want to come along and i was like sweet like this okay let's do this key to um, students are right and then i i thought this is interesting it's essentially what a packaging technologist is doing is you've got the marketing side you've got the branding people who are um are, are bringing a product to market 
And then you've got the R&D center in between where they're developing the packaging that can go around the product. So you might be developing new, new packaging. You might be, uh, there's obviously a huge amount of productivity work being done um, and productivity in, in packaging itself, but it could also be in productivity and making packaging run down the line quicker. So I work there in their coffee facility, Craft Foods Coffee Facility in Oxfordshire. And a lot of the work at the time, it was was inadvertently sustainability focused because a lot of it was to do with lightweighting, mm. lightweighting materials to save costs. And the same was true for the coffee. How do we, um, productivity, how do we make this coffee a bit cheaper? Can we change the quality slightly? Take a bit more of the good stuff out, put yeah. a bit more of the, the bad stuff in. You know, it's like, <laughs> will anyone notice the flavor difference? And that productivity was always sort of leading the way in sustainability anyway. So I did a lot of work on lightweight in packaging. Um, and you know, it's a, sort of what led me into that is what led me into focusing more on sustainability. And I got this chance to work on a project where they wanted to lightweight all of their glass jars. Now, at the time, like, they make brands like Kenko and Carnot, it's a huge yeah, range. working across a portfolio across all of Europe. So they would have saved all this glass and they're saying this is a two year project to bring to market. And I was just there thinking, I am not proud of this. Like when I go and tell my mates, see that jar on the supermarket <laughs> shelf, I, I did that, I changed that. They're gonna say, oh, nice. But, but, but <laughs> yeah. No one's gonna care. So for nice. me, that was literally the point where I thought that no, this, I, I'm making stuff. I wanted to make stuff, but I want to make stuff that um, I can be proud of, or I want to like feel like I'm making a change. Sounds a bit cliche, but like that I'm actually no, having totally. an impact. And actually, it's something that has a purpose. Yeah. So that's sort of you know a bit of a long-winded way of saying what the packaging technologist was, because the packaging technologist on a whole is is a vital role i guess in any organization of bringing a product to market or keeping it on the market but for me it was after just a couple of years there really it was clear to me in that sort of organization that was not where i wanted to be yeah um it was there that i suppose that's led me on to my next role i worked for TerraCycle. yeah and um like TerraCycle is essentially the premise when i was at TerraCycle was just about anything in the world can be recycled mm. so they're a us-based organization i was lucky enough to meet tom who's their founder ceo and i met him while at craft actually and i just was inspired by the sort of uh, his mantra this idea that you know you can do anything all materials are a resource you could it doesn't matter what it is it could be your pen it could be a cup it could be um you know this microphone all of those things anything can be recycled as long as you can you can get it in a pure enough source and and everything has a, a new life and it was just about designing the right systems for all of that <clears throat> so obviously that's quite that was quite an inspiring like thought at the time he was trying to come to the uk yeah so i set up the uk business for him at the time oh, wow literally operating out of a lounge <laughs> um, then we had the little office in london and then it, it sort of boomed and the company's actually sort of flourished and grown out of there um and is now yeah i mean operating so that's quite a different role then hugely different like i had basically no qualifications for that role other than, the, <laughs> than my passion for the cause that's probably one of the most important ones with a role like that though i can imagine rather than actually yeah well, i suppose you also need to know how to run a business but yeah so the, the the how to run a business sort of came later that was so i remember when i got the job um he shook my hand and he said congratulations you're now an entrepreneur and i didn't know what that meant <laughs> <laughs> until about I don't know, six months in when I'm getting up in the middle of the night to drive to a warehouse to, to deal with the waste we were collecting and, mm. you know, thinking, all right, this is all encompassing. I, you're literally, I'm responsible for every single yeah. thing going on here. But, um, I mean, do you want, should I tell you a bit about the sort of terror cycle? Yeah, go for The it. journey of like what, what I learned there and why I'm sort of into yeah. reuse now at Keep Cut. So, um, like when you look at recycling as you know it, the the challenge with um, so we've been recycling in this country now what for fifty odd years, 
Um, and the most recyclable items, as you think about it, they're going to be like your milk bottles, your plastic bottles, your steel cans, any yeah. glass. That's the stuff that you know, or paper. They're staples. You put it in your recycling bin. And really with recycling, what it comes down to is um, you have to get enough value after collecting that material, processing it. And processing it can be washing it. Um, could be in some cases sterilizing it shredding it reprocessing it back into another useful material and then selling it again to be used again so um it sounds obvious but when you've got as many materials now on the market as you have and you know something as simple as a pen could have 15 different materials in sure, it sure yeah and you've got the ink in there as well and ink's considered hazardous so like when you just look at and that's an everyday item yeah now extrapolate that out across everyday life it's exceptionally complex all of these materials are useful but not in the complex forms where they've all been mixed together so what we were trying to do was set up bespoke um, systems for materials that the recycling systems itself couldn't handle take those materials find a way of funding those systems because a lot of the materials we were taking care of wouldn't self-fund right. you know it's not possible there's there's not enough value in all of the parts of a pen once it's been separated to pay for itself. It, there's, okay, it's yeah. too expensive to separate a pen to make out any money out of recycling it at the other end. Um, so the whole business model is when I was involved in it was really about like, how do we get these materials? How do we convert them into something useful and how do we sell them on and how do we get funding for that? And to fund it, um, like what added value can you can you give? So mm. so for a lot of people that's about marketing or how they talk to their consumers by making those products recyclable. Sure. Um, so I did that for about eight years. And what became apparent to me was just how immensely difficult it was ever going to be to solve all of the all of our waste problems mm. through recycling. Um, I think you know we were chatting early, briefly earlier about recycling and you having like seven containers at your home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? and um, and that's because you need to separate it into all of these different containers to make it worth any money. The moment you start mixing that stuff in, contaminating it, it's just contaminating. It's useless. So the unless we all suddenly switch to just having the same material, just like glass, metal, one type of plastic, paper which then stops any innovation in products, stops anyone having any fun with what the packaging sure. looks like. Unless we went back to this kind of like harmonized palette of materials where it's really simple, I can't see any way the recycling industry can ever solve our problems or succeed. Right. And then last year or two years ago now, I think, was that you had like the markets like China closing the doors on taking recycled or waste material from other markets. Now, when you think about that, we take so much of our products from other from other countries, mm. and we don't have that much manufacturing in the UK, relatively. Yeah, but all the waste is here, right? <laughs> so you've got all these products, you've got all this packaging. We're putting it into our recycling system, which can't handle it anyway, and then trying to keep it on the British Isles. Mm. We don't need it. Yeah. So no wonder there's not enough value in the end material to go back into items. It's, there's too much of it. And as soon as overseas start saying, we don't want your waste, you know, we're in this, and this leads into a whole other conversation around what would be the circular economy and, yeah. and, and keeping things local. So it's like anything, once you dive so deep into a topic, I just thought, well, for me, the answer to this is not in the systems that we're currently in, but actually you've got to get outside of this system and think, how do we stop generating so much waste in the first place? Yeah. And um, I looked around for a while and then uh, came across this position at Keep Cup. Who I had no idea by the time I heard about Keep Cup, they'd already been going eight years. Wow. So we're over 10 years old now at Keep Cup. See, I like, I can't, like, I, I've known Keep Cup for obviously quite a while, but I would never have guessed that they've been around that long. Definitely, sort of ahead of their ahead of their time, yeah, I would say. Yeah, completely. Um, and it just got me thinking: we've got to get people consuming less or using less resource. Mm. And that was the natural step for me: is to see, um, 
So I've gone from sort of taking and making something that, you know, ultimately I was putting products on the market that people didn't need. Then recycling, you're trying to deal, you're trying to deal with what, and the recycling industry in the UK, the other thing that's frustrating is it's just assumed that it's like the state's problem. Yeah. Right. So you, it's like, there's a right to, um, to take a product, use it, and then someone else has to deal with the waste. Well, I think that's kind of like messed up that you just assume that that's, if it's not someone being recycled, else's that's issue. not your fault. Yeah, you have to take some responsibility and the business has to take, that's produced that product has to take some responsibility for what they've put on the market. If you're consuming something that's on the market that can't be recycled, you should think about that. Mm. And the business putting it on the market should think about that. Yeah. Not just say it's government's problem to make sure it gets recycled because you're giving them an impossible task. They can never win. And no. when you're coming up with that fancy new material or composite package, they're not consulting the guys at the other end of the chain. Yeah, saying, yeah. By the way, when they chuck this in the bin, that's all right. Yeah. yeah. Like, so all of that just got me thinking, no, we've got to do better. We've got to like, got to get products off the market. We've got to stop consuming the way we are. Convenience culture is nuts. Like go back. Somebody told me about, I don't know who to credit this to, but the idea of a shifting baseline syndrome. And it was told to me in the form of nature. Um, so when I was a kid, you'd go on a country ride in the car and um, you'd, at the end, you'd get loads of bugs on the windscreen, mm. right? You'd have to wash the car. Or where I grew up, down by the South Downs um, in Sussex, it would be really normal to see um, hedgehogs or badgers. And you don't see any of these things anymore. Like yeah. in one generation, it's gone. The same is true for like consumer change in consumption if you go back to like your grandparents and said to them one day you'll be drinking um water from a bottle and carrying it around with you they say you're nuts like yeah water comes from the tap why am i going to buy it in a plastic bottle what's the matter with you so can we now in another generation shift it back in the other way and actually really question convenience culture and get people reusing and looking at things differently yeah well like you know it's going to your water bottle thing like one of the ones that jumps to mind is the new carlsberg bottles which are completely made out of paper yeah like it seems like such an odd idea to drink a beer out of paper like you know totally on board with it being able to be a recyclable bottle but imagine telling your granddad that you'll be drinking yeah a carlsberg <laughs> out of a paper bottle that you'd be like yeah it's mad and like some of this as well like so that's that touches on a, a point as well which i'm sort of particularly get particularly passionate about yeah. at the moment which is like this idea of preserving the status quo by replacing one material with another material, yeah. right? And I don't know why they've gone for a paper bottle at Carlsberg, but metal is really, really recyclable. Yeah. Put it in a can. Um, I yeah. Don't know, and I don't know why they went from glass. Glass is also recyclable. That's probably a safety thing, mind you. But, but where this is really bizarre to me is in... Um, so I went to one of these packaging innovation shows in London again recently and they're the least innovative shows because <laughs> of course well we'll think about it right where's all the good innovation it's behind closed doors yeah so these are the lo least innovative places you can ever go to and um, the people that are willing to scream and shout about it right and it's all about material replacement so somebody will say at the moment it's all about plastics bad it's not just plastic it you know there's got to be more context to that. Sure. Some plastic is bad. Plastic used in single-use items or used unwisely is bad. But people hear plastic's bad. Okay, I must replace um, this plastic pack with something. I'm going to take this plant-based pack instead. No, it's not. Like, what's the problem you're trying to solve? It's convenience that's bad. Like, yeah. if you replace um, a plastic stirrer with a wooden stirrer, you know, ultimately it would still be better just to have had a spoon. Yeah. Um, there's, <laughs> so there's, we over engineer like solutions by looking at material replacements all the time. We try and take plastic out of something, but then replace it with something just as harmful. Mm. And composting is the one that's sort of, this has had this sort of proliferation of the composting industry where you now have um, loads of compostable packaging on the market which has been designed to replace plastic packaging but there is no more a system for collecting that that than there was the plastic yeah. so you're but just... people hear the word compostable and you're like oh it'll dissolve like yeah a... magic poof it'll yeah. disappear right well, and then <laughs> also assume that it will happen within like days as well i think like but no it takes like isn't it like 10 plus years or something oh and there's various 
standards of composting or biodegradability and they all have um, test methods that dictate how it has to be done but ultimately most of it is going to require some sort of well-managed composting facility with heat and moisture and for it to be maintained at a certain way that's going to turn it over and make it compost mm. but another thing to think about like the composting industry on the whole was there um, to take food and byproducts from farming and such to to invest back into that space they need nutrient rich compost to go back into their soil yeah, of course taking um you know i can eat a cardboard box <laughs> but i'm not going to get any <laughs> nutrients out of doing so yeah. right so it's taking a cardboard cup so there's a lot of compostable cups yeah that's not fit for purpose in the system but before you even get to that the systems themselves can't distinguish between a compostable cup and a paper cup or a compostable plastic bottle or a regular plastic bottle. So first of all, you you haven't got an infrastructure to sort that material. Mm. And then the infrastructure to deal with it isn't really there either. There's not a lot of commercial composting systems anywhere in the world, really. It's just yeah. not an infrastructure that's been well developed. Yeah, that's absolutely crazy when you think how many people switch over to these solutions inverted commas yeah uh, <laughs> that well you know like greenwash is sort of a dirty word now where but greenwash like anything that would be because i don't want to say that it, for me it's so easy to make a statement something is compostable and people will go oh that sounds great yeah i can just stick that in my garden <laughs> <laughs> but to, un to unravel that takes like a lot of explanation as to why that's not really compostable and why you can't put that in your food waste bin and yeah and it's just so happened at signal now like not allowed to put veg bear cups into our food waste anymore because it the people that actually deal with the recycling have kind of said no right so now a veg bear compostable cup needs to go into general waste which just seems completely redundant yeah <laughs> and, and and the thing is that again this comes down to people in the chain not talking to each other so my girlfriend went on a bit of a, a twitter rant we were out in um crystal palace walking around the the triangle there of shops mm. and somebody had these new coffee capsules advertised in one of the shops saying they're compostable she went and said how are these compostable i said i don't know she reads the pack <laughs> and um they said you can put them in your local um you can just put it in your home composting bin when you're done so she rings up the Croydon Council and they say that's absolute nonsense. We don't take any packaging in um, our composting bin. Yeah. She goes back to the brand and they say, uh, no, they can. The council's wrong. And the council say, no, we're not wrong. And, and, yeah. And so it and then, so it goes on. They're not talking to each other. It's it's not that they're not compostable under very specific conditions, but those conditions are unrealistic in everyday life and yeah. the facilities aren't there for them and ultimately even if they were there the end output isn't desirable yeah completely like for the listeners who maybe aren't aware of keep cup um would you mind kind of keep cup is much bigger than just reusable cups like you're like actually kind of on a mission to kind of be obviously a responsible business uh could you just tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. We've gone a long way without even talking about keep. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble. No. Um, <laughs> so keep cup. Yeah, essentially it it is a, a reusable cup, um, a reusable takeaway cup it, at its pure, base, most basic form. But we are on a mission really to get people thinking about single use um, culture and convenience and and what that you know why it why it's there. Does it need does it need to be there? Um, if you take it back, so we were founded a little over 10 years ago and Abigail and her brother, Jamie, who founded the, the business, they were, um, they were running a cafe chain at the time. And it was really around about the time. So if you go back, say 20 years, that was when coffee cups were just becoming, takeaway coffee was just yeah. becoming popular. That's why I like, it, it's still like that whole the keep cup is 10 years old is yeah kind of blowing my mind a little bit and it was becoming popular because of sort of popular culture you would watch us tv and you'd see people carrying around a cup yeah um and that was sort of um meant you were successful right because you're on the you're on the go you've got your laptop in one hand your cup in the other sure. and um 
Abigail, so she, um, she's the the owner, uh, the manager, director of the business and, and the founder. And she was telling me how early on she remembers people um, coming in and, and saying, but I feel like a baby drinking from this strange paper cup. This is like weird. Why, why would anyone want to do this? Because the older generation would have sat down and had a coffee. And the idea of having it in a takeaway cup was so foreign. Again, yeah. this like shifting baseline idea, right? For them, that was such a foreign idea. But now people entering the coffee industry or taking a coffee now, it's the, that's their baseline, yeah. having it in a takeaway. Um, so they started looking around, wanted to see if there was something um, they could use, like literally just buy a Thermos flask or something they could use in the store as an alternative, and it just didn't exist. So they're looking at this thinking, well, is this because people don't want a reusable cup? Is it, you know, is there concerns that it's not suitable for some reason? And the mm. only sort of equivalent was soup mugs. So you could get okay. soup mugs for on the go. And they got in some of these decor soup mugs and started offering discount on their soup if people use them and managed to get 15% of their regular customers to actually switch to a reusable soup mug. Okay. So that was when the, the sort of the, yeah, the light bulb. Yeah. yeah, because there was never real, really a desire to become a product business, but that was, now you're talking about behavioral change. People will change their behavior and the, the discount was obviously key so yeah. they offered um especially when there's an incentive involved <laughs> right so if you offer an incentive people will change their behavior and the disposable cups and the disposable soup mugs weren't without a cost so it was they were able to offer mm. a discount because now they're not having to store all those cups and they, they're you know so there is some savings in there as well not that that always covers the discount of course at yeah. some of these places but um, so that was kind of the light bulb moment. And from there, it was really sort of an interesting story as, as to how they design the product and, and bring it to market. The um, I remember Ab Abigail sort of telling me about the first prototype and taking it to some of the um, stuff so because for her, it was always meant to be a local solution. There, this was out in Melbourne. Yeah. So the, the company itself is still headquartered in Melbourne and was founded out that way. And they had a cafe chain in, right in the heart of Melbourne um, called Blue Bag. And the the solution originally was meant to be for themselves. Like, we're here behind the machine. We're, how do we, what do we want to serve our customers in that works for us as baristas and coffee shop owners, but also means they're not having to use these wasteful disposable Yeah, cups. sure. And there was a moment, it's probably worth pointing out there was a moment that they became aware that these disposable cups because everyone thought as well for a really long time that they're paper cups they're recyclable yeah i've got a note about that like that like even the some of the recyclable paper cups still aren't recyclable because they've got that lining in them they're basically all of them yeah yeah 90 so the the statistics on how many we use around the world there's something like one million cups used every minute like if you take the whole planet and they all have this plastic liner in it to make it um make it waterproof yeah waterproof, watertight sorry. right because liquid would just yeah. pour through it otherwise <laughs> yeah. and it's so It'd become a very soggy cup otherwise and it's so obvious but yet the average person because we sort of live in bubbles when you're in a major city but your average person will still believe that it's a paper cup and therefore it just goes in your paper yeah, with a plastic thing i can recycle that plastic right but Not the lid case. itself is plastic and the lid it, that plastic lid is a lot of material and that can't be recycled either so that was sort of the first piece they became aware of that mm. and it was once they became aware of that problem that they looked at how do we start solving it and um went through the sort of soup mug piece that i just described then they thought right well how do we get a, a cup in and started trying to design something and what was clear to them from the beginning was they wanted to design a cup that worked for them as baristas so when you look at our original product the keep cup original it looks like a reusable takeaway cup yeah it's got a hard press on lid it's got the same sort of shape and form it fits under the coffee group heads in the same way it allows you to pour the coffee and the milk in the same way mm. like so from behind the machine it operates the exact same way it won't slow down the service right um you know it hasn't got one of these weird rubbery lids that you have to try and get on if you yeah. don't have a screw top it's designed to work so well for the barista but also from the consumer side they wanted something that um you know wasn't didn't stand out too much 
like it wasn't too conspicuous so you can use it and not feel like, like you're ostracized making... or almost yeah because we always wanted to position it right even right from the get-go at the middle of the market not at the ultra greenies where you're gonna because you can get ostracized that way yeah but wanted to be right in the middle of the the market so that people felt like this was something they were comfortable doing of course um but the product design's fun as well because they uh, they they came up with this prototype and uh, they took it to some people and they just said, "Well, it's just a plastic cup." It's like, "What are you doing? This uh, we're not going to make this for you. Yeah. You need if if you want us to manufacture this product for you, you've got to first sell the idea." And I think that was even when I heard that, I thought that is so crucial for anyone that's starting up a business is going out there and selling the concept to people be it your friends your family or then the eventual who you perceive as the eventual customers sure so abigail's taken this prototype at the time that the lid didn't even come off mm. the, it was just physical like rigid prototype and going out to businesses and pitching the whole concept of what it's for what we're trying to achieve the the purpose is that uh, and not just to cafes mind you but to offices saying you can replace all of the um the disposable cups in your office by moving to this product and getting buy-in before you've even taken it to the manufacturing stage yeah. and it's such a sort of a crucial step in the development because if you can't sell that if you can't sell that idea if you can't get people hooked on what you your what you see as the the vision and the market for the product don't waste time making it perfect and bringing it to yeah market. like it, yeah it's like one of these, it doesn't matter how good your idea is, that it's no good if nobody knows yeah. or believes in it, you know? And and seek out criticism, right? You don't want everyone who agrees with you. If you're just sort of in some sort of like echo chamber where everyone's patting you on the back and saying, great, go for it. You need people who are going to tell you that it's a dumb idea yeah. so you can figure out why. why. it's a dumb idea. Yeah, and maybe that's just not your target audience. Like, So that was really interesting hearing about that sort of, so I, so I wasn't at the business in the business then but just hearing about that startup journey was it was great and then how they took the business from so you know i guess the aspiration was relatively low at the time let's, <laughs> let's find a solution for ourselves in melbourne but it went global because um really because of some of the because it was solving a problem, I yeah. guess is the main reason it's gone global, is, is it solves a genuine um, need. Mm. But what what really facilitated that early on was um, working with baristas. So working with the coffee shops, we, uh, uh, we talk about influencers sure, like a yeah. lot of the, now, right? So, and if you talk about an influencer campaign now, you think someone's going to pay someone a on instagram to, yeah. to hold your product right that's <laughs> that's influencers what influencers should be is finding the people that give you that social license or permission to use your product this was right. a product designed to solve a problem of disposable cups but also to work well for baristas behind the coffee machine and when you speak to the baristas about that and you bring them on that journey that starts um doing something magical because now they're they're yeah they're a part of it they're a part of it and they're giving the consumer permission so when you walk into the coffee shop with your keep cup and they say hey nice keep cut mate yeah. and and allow you to to have that field because that's one of the barriers the first time i took a keep cup into a shop i thought oh man <laughs> i'm gonna <laughs> be judged i'm gonna be judged everyone in the queue is gonna think i'm some sort of tree hugger <laughs> right um so that's what the influencer was for us, finding the people that give permission for your product. And again, I think that applies to like any new development. Yeah. What problem are you solving and who are the people that are going to give that permission? Yeah. So how big is Keep Cup now? Because it is global. But... Yeah. So we fairly soon after launching, so we launched the product launched in 2009 in Australia. Um, and Abigail's other brother was, was out in London at the time. And she said, look, this is, it's, it works. People yeah. want this product here. You should have a go in London. So we launched in London pretty soon afterwards, pretty much uh, 2010, I think. Um, and we now have a, an office out in LA as well that came a few years later. Wow. And globally, we're about 100 staff. So the, the bulk of that's still in the right. HQ. So it's still like 
Yeah. I was expecting it to be like way larger than that for some reason. Yeah, I mean, when That's you awesome, think about though, it, because like, you're doing like such amazing work with not a huge workforce. Yeah, and we're quite focused. You know, we mm. still just have the, the the cups is our product range, of course. So it's a relatively um, uh, narrow focus in terms of our products. Um, so we got these free hubs globally. We that includes a warehouse. So every office has a warehouse as part of it. So we're based. Our London office is out in Leighton. Just, okay, just uh, just just east of Waltham, Waltham South Central, um, and we have a warehouse on the the lower floor and the office on the upper floor. And all of the parts come in individually and is assembled there. So a lot of the components are actually oh, now wow. made in the UK. In Australia, the parts are made in Australia and shipped. That's cool. And then it's all assembled on site. I can imagine that's also probably quite unique for a company like yourselves. Yes. To like, have everything done there. <laughs> and so nice. And so nice for the sales team and all of the staff outside of the operations to see it because we're so used to finished goods just showing up. Yeah. And to see and to know and to socialize with the people who are putting them together and to understand the, how that works and to understand how your sales decisions or customer decisions can immediately impact that person that you personally yeah. know in the warehouse who has to do the work to put that together. Like silly things, if someone says they want some sort of bespoke sticker on there and they've ordered a thousand cups, yeah. you know the person who's gonna have to put those 1,000 <laughs> stickers on. So it's more in your interest to, <laughs> yeah. to help them out. Um, so oh, that could, would completely change your perception of the whole design process of it as well. Like even if you decided to change even the simplest part of your packaging, but maybe it's a, that makes it a little bit trickier to assemble the box or whatever yeah. it may be, the time that, you know, compound that over a gazillion cups or whatever it is, you know, like you're suddenly... For sure. It makes it very real. It's not just some machine or stranger in a foreign country. It's somebody downstairs that you probably eat lunch with. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's so nice because that's dying out. The way that the sort of world of manufacturing has gone over the last decades is that, um, you know, I just think back to my time at Craft when a lot of my work, my job there in the engineering side kept moving further east. Mm. because manufacturing first Cost. of all got moved from the UK to France then it got moved from France to like the Czech Republic and then it was from the Czech Republic to Russia and it just kept going and going further yeah. further east because of cost and ultimately like it's obvious that local manufacturing has benefits people talk about the benefits of local manufacturing but we don't necessarily go beneath the surface of why that that can be sometimes and for us local manufacturing has so many perks it means that we can work closely with our supply chain on quality mm. so um if i was sourcing the, the the plastic parts from china it's very hard to have a conversation or even to go and visit the the factory sure and to talk about quality and to talk about what's important to us but because i get those parts from the midlands it's quite easy to go up there we know that everyone knows us we all we all get on well we all know what we're working towards yeah it feels like more of a partnership not that it can't feel like that overseas but, but it's, it's trickier it, it's trickier exactly and then you bring the parts in and it, and assemble it on site and you see everything that goes into that but the other thing so it helps with you know like quality and lead times and if if, if there's any issues it, it's it's easier to troubleshoot but also from a circularity perspective having local manufacturing supports a circular economy yeah of course you can take materials back like our dream would be how do we we want people to repurpose their products replace parts when they can't be used anymore or worst case can we take them back and make them into new keep cups and you can only do that effectively if you've got a local Absolutely. manufacturing so Oh wow, that's cool though. Like I first came across uh, keep cups, and as you're saying, kind of in the smaller artisan kind of hipstery coffee shops. Um, like, is there been a like a bit of a change in focus from 
you know, probably starting out, obviously it was very a very local problem that became like a global business. Have you had to switch from like kind of direct to consumer versus going via like you know B to B to C, or has it always been one way? Or yeah, it's interesting actually. Because um, you can obviously just buy. You can go to keepcup dot com and buy a cup. Yeah, and I think the the um, wherever you get your cup, you get it from a cafe, you get it from your office, you buy it online. It always comes back to the cafe, mm. right? That's the, how we look at it. Is it always the 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 point is it should always end up back in the barista's hand serving you a coffee. So of course. we've always focused on them first, and there's been a an element of luck involved because the product originally was designed for the way that Australians and probably you know more specifically like Melbourne and Sydney mm. how they drink their coffee that flat white culture yeah it was designed for that, but that coffee drinking culture has, has grown has there. grown and we're here in Shoreditch I bet you if we went into a coffee shop around the corner there's going to be an Aussie or a Kiwi behind the <laughs> yeah the, the, the bar serving you right yeah. so that culture has gone global and we went with it so I talked about how we worked very closely we got in very early with the local chains in Melbourne and Sydney and really worked closely with those um those baristas and they're the people who have gone off around the world and and helped keep cup grow as well mm. so there has been that sort of we've we've traveled with the coffee the coffee industry but the at the time like 10 years ago when we launched here in the uk it was definitely a very different um coffee and even now it's still a different coffee marketplace we have a lot more big chains in the uk you've got people like costa who are just a behemoth they've yeah. got something like 2500 stores in the uk wow where so we're very popular in the independent scene and they really get what we're about but once you start talking about chains of that scale you're talking about a business model that is so inherently based on the takeaway cup yeah that it's and a, harder to shift their perception probably oh, or it's just a make totally a different conversation um because yeah they you know that their entire model is based on the those takeaway cups existing yeah of course i also find it like you know with people like starbucks as well like i always find it funny that you know i'm sure they're doing other things in terms of sustainability but in terms of their cups like they actually try and make their cups more desirable at christmas time and things like that with the red cups and things like that like people want to be carrying around a red them. starbucks cup and you're like you're not you're not helping yeah. no um <laughs> such an odd one but um yeah isn't that funny um and you wouldn't get it in and the the, the strange thing about a coffee cup as well is it's such a luxury because you really it's a product that you really only have for about 10 minutes yeah and then you put it in the bin but the reason they they do this is it's it's in your hand right it's a walking billboard for these organizations mm. that starbucks cup with the reindeer is going to make somebody else sit up and go hey that cup's cool oh i want a starbucks yeah i could really do with a festive gingerbread latte right yeah. now right <laughs> it's but it is it's a walking yeah. advertisement and to some extent that's as well that's we benefited from that the bright colors the the vibrant keep cup design yeah if that was just if that was a lunchbox and it was hidden in someone's bag yeah it's not doing you any favor right so that's something really powerful about that brand in hand experience mm. and that's these brands that are doing these kind of regular pack changes or these festive designs they're the ones that you're seeing in people's hands that's yeah. all about catching the eyes of the people around them yeah yeah uh, we spoke on the phone a few weeks back and you you mentioned uh, sorry if i'm butchering this but you mentioned like keep cup being a responsible business not just a sustainable business which kind of struck a chord with me could you kind of yeah. explain what you meant by that yeah and this is um so we heard someone talk at patagonia and they were saying there's no not really any such thing as a sustainable business anymore because or maybe there never was a sustain because the most sustainable thing you could do is shut your doors right if <laughs> yeah so yeah. if we want to be thought about that, that way, but yeah so if we completely stop making products we will be better for the planet for it but um but what you can do is be a responsible business so 
being responsible is looking at your whole supply chain, but not just from an environmental perspective, a well-being perspective, how you pay your staff, how you pay the people in your supply chain, how they treat the um, societies around them, how they, you know, um, you know are, are, you con are you contributing to community in what you're doing? And that can also then be, because the other challenge when you talk about sustainability is you end up quite narrowly focused on like supply chain and moving materials around but being responsible applies to everyone yeah any office can be more responsible if it's in the products they source to use in the bathroom um, the way they pay their staff the way they look after their staff's well-being all of that applies to everyone so we can all be more responsible and by all being more responsible that will naturally make everyone more sustainable because if you're considering what stationery you purchase for your office yeah and you're making it the most sustainable choice or the most responsible choice it's going to have a knock-on effect. Yeah, of course. This is a get a really interesting way of thinking about it, though. That's just kind of what. Yeah, well, one of the so there's an organization called B Corp, B Corporation, which it came out of the US, um, and we're one of the founding members in Australia, and we have a oh, global right. B Corp certification. But the idea, it 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 came from um, a small company that made T-shirts. And they were really cool T-shirts, a lot of popularity, and they were purchased, and they and they had a lot of these social elements in. They really looked after their staff. They really invested heavily into their supply chain. They worked um, closely with their suppliers. You know, everyone. It was a really nice story. Mm. And then they were purchased, I think, by Nike, and all of that was stripped out for productivity and profit margins. Right. And the the owners of that business were so sad that that spurred them to come up with this kind of certification or uh, movement where where you you can have that kind of stamp of approval on the whole business and that's how they founded the oh, idea right. of the okay. so and and it's hard like the surveys and the certification there's a lot that you have to cover it's it's no it's not something you enter into lightly yeah but doing it has been such a great experience and we've improved for it so they will give you if you really like commit to doing it, there's advice and templates and they'll help you get better. So mm. um, it's not just, they're not looking to just sort of tick boxes. They're giving you examples and um, the tools to improve your business as well. Yeah, so yeah. that's something that we've really um, embraced and keep doing. So you have to keep recertifying and keep getting better. And there's certainly still a lot we can keep doing to improve how we are Of course, like there's all, there always is with these things, whether it's sustainability or, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. But uh, one of the things that I love about Keep Cup is not only like you're talking, you, there's obviously um, a kind of desirability element to it as well, because it's not like a ugly looking cup it's like being a beautifully designed cup uh, and it's also solving a problem but the kind of message is always kind of genuine and pretty transparent as well and i was just wondering do you feel that a lot of companies just tend to tick the box the sustainability box oh we did this for six months look at us we're ever so sustainable and we have cracked down on our recycling by two percent or do you think there's a, a genuine kind of paradigm shift going on where people genuinely do want to become more sustainable there's still both it's yeah. still both um so there's still a lot of box ticking going on um there's still a lot of people buying on price and not on quality yeah. just in our space so a few years ago there was conversation in the house of commons event about potentially having um putting a levy or a tax on cups and as yeah. soon as that happened, competition for our type of product came out of the woodwork. And some of it, frankly, was just garbage, very cheap cups that will not last. And some of some of them even said they're only good for about 30 uses. That's not <laughs> responsible, right? <laughs> no. So when you're then a procurement department being told, we need reusable cups now. We need to replace our disposables. We need reusables inside our office. And that... Um, a lot of people were still just buying on price and we're getting a lot of people coming back to us now saying the the product that we purchased just didn't have longevity in it and we need something with more quality but that's not everyone you know so there is that 
it, that still needs to change. Yeah. But it is changing. The the amount of people that are now taking more responsible decisions and digging deeper and actually looking beneath the surface of some of these claims is hugely changed in the last few years. Yeah, yeah. Do you think, uh, like, in order for companies to become, you know, more responsible rather than just sustainable, do you think that, you know, you mentioned the kind of levy that was on cups and the ironic thing is that they tax the person buying them, not the company. Yeah. Uh, it's like we had to, you know, people who are buying them had to pay an extra whatever to use a cup rather than the business, so to speak. But do you think there needs to be like a legislation or like a law change in order to kind of like force these kind of big companies to become more responsible? Or do you, is that kind of like a, you know, because you're not really putting a law or legislation in place doesn't mean you're not changing their behavior you, you, you yeah. are but for the wrong reasons they're not genuinely wanting to do it they're doing it because they have to yeah is that like do you see that as a solution or do you want them to actually genuinely want to do it um i'd love it if everyone genuinely just <laughs> wanted to do it i think it is going to require some sort of legislative legislative shift to take it to the next level yeah um i wouldn't want it's interesting what you say about it being taxing the consumer rather than the business mm. i think we have to find a way of putting the sort of joint responsibility out there so yeah. on one hand i think it's important consumers know what the environmental cost is of their decisions but businesses have to do that as well so with a, a, a fine in the same way that we've done a carrier bag fine yeah a fine or a charge for a cup i think is a good idea but i wouldn't necessarily um, I don't think we need to change the net cost of a cup of coffee. So if a cup of coffee is three pound, let's say, yeah, um, and twenty five p of that is the cup, for argument's sake, mm. let's charge the coffee at two seventy five and say it's twenty five p for a cup. So the end, the end cost to the consumer is still the same. Yeah, and call that out, like call it out that this cup's going to cost you twenty five p. So if you want a cup then yeah you've got to pay for it. Pence. and how do we do that and because the other thing is i don't think it's right to just focus on cups i think from a legislative point of view a fine on cups will make obviously a huge difference in how um takeaway culture is perceived and and people and will people will shift more to reusables or hopefully sitting in and not even needing yeah of course a takeaway cup but it's got to be broader it's got to be single use like unnecessary unnecessary single use items there's so many of them um like what about a world where when you buy a takeaway sandwich it tells you this packaging costs 15 pence or um knives and forks and knives and yeah. forks plastic bottles still yeah like why do we need all of these things on the go if it, but you you just assume every time you buy something all of that packaging all of those consumables they're a free addition yeah because there's no price associated with them. So I think breaking out the cost of packaging would do a lot to sort of incentivize the consumer to think outside the box on, mm. on other ways of delivering it. Yeah. I've never wondered why water doesn't come in like an aluminium can. Right? Yeah. Like, it's like and there's a few, there's obviously brands out there doing it. There are now. There's people uh, starting especially to. like sparkling water market, like ugly water and things like that. Like I'm a big fan of those guys. But like just still water why doesn't it come in a can why doesn't it just come out of the tap and we all have uh <laughs> more access to it though, yeah. as well right yeah when did we decide that we needed to start purchasing the water and carrying it around yeah from a shop so yeah especially like you know we always used to joke back at home because uh parents live in dumblane and literally a few miles down the road is the highland spring mm. facility so you've probably got highland spring coming out your shower like why, why would why would you go and buy water i've just never oh, understood absolutely. it absolutely uh, but this is about um you know thinking about what is the problem we're trying to solve and water for me you know it's everywhere and now the water it has shifted so much as that now there is legislation that if you're serving you have to offer tap water mm. but i remember not that long ago going into places and in restaurants not being able to get tap water yeah, you have to buy you a have bottle. to buy a bottle that's you know it's insane really yeah it um, is completely insane um when we spoke on the phone a few weeks back we were uh well you were telling me you were at like a round table event or something like that that you're invited to to discuss kind of behavior change 
and you kind of had a bit of a an interesting take on it which is something that totally um was right up my alley in terms of the jobs to be done to you that i mentioned to you because i think you were discussing that you know yes single-use plastic cups is a bad thing yeah um but like why are we carrying around coffee in the first place like yeah. if you look at like you know the kind of bigger problem uh you know that's the problem to solve not yeah. necessarily the, like long term not necessarily the single-use plastic cup which is like i said incredibly close to the jobs to be done theory which if you aren't familiar with by all means go check out it's very interesting but the the whole premise of that is like i said to you on the phone is nobody wants a quarter inch drill bit they want the quarter inch hole they Absolutely, want the result right? of which but they want a better way of making a quarter inch hole not having to con continually innovate a quarter inch drill bit for example um is this like a just like a personal interest of yours or is that thing that is that the way you kind of look at things that keep cup in general and have you thought about what a potential solution for not having to carry around a cup at all but still enjoy coffee would be yes yeah, so it's and this is sort of if you look as you look to sort of the future of keep cup and we want to be more involved in advocacy and behavioral change and tackling single use and convenience on the whole we're still i guess refining part of our position in that and yeah. and, and going to these sort of round table events is certainly part of it i was in scotland talking about um sh should we be having a potential tax on cups should it be a fine on cups and what are the other solutions and one of the solutions that's come up is the idea of do we have a loan system for cups where uh you essentially you'd go into a cafe and they you would be loaned a cup and then when you're finished with it you would drop it back off in a bin or back in, in yeah cafe. i've seen like i've seen a couple of companies that in the uk that have kind of done this and it's like a central bin yeah thing. trying to, and the easiest way to describe it is maybe like the shared bike systems you pick up a bike you ride it and and for me it, because there's such a, like a like laser focus on cups and not the bigger issue sure the bigger issue is people want to consume on the go and it's not just coffee it's everything it's yeah. convenience Tea, culture juices, as a whole. Right. now if we focus in on like some very bespoke system for solving cup coffee on the go by offering the cup share scheme of coffee that's only solving very very narrow problem and it's incredibly complicated you're putting you're not actually changing behaviors you're just putting the responsibility on someone else because it's still not your responsibility to clean that cup it's still not your responsibility to store that cup yeah. it's just shifting responsibility around and system-based approaches to problems of, of waste haven't worked recycling hasn't worked composting's not working so why would we now introduce a loan scheme for cups it's yeah. not the, <laughs> the the job to be done is that person wants to enjoy a delicious coffee now the reality is it's very hard like a flat white what takes five minutes to, yeah. to enjoy yeah the reality is it's quite difficult for me to have a, to to enjoy that on the way to work not in a takeaway now yeah there isn't businesses where you could go in sit at a speed bar like so in italy you would still go and have a shot of espresso right. stood up at a bar outside a train station in a ceramic cup and you would leave your money on the table and you walk away yeah that culture has still got that sort of embedded in in the way that they consume coffee so it's about rethinking the way we consume as a whole um and, and getting people to sit down slow down i've started and this is perhaps more of a personal interest at the moment but trying to like understand how that also affects well-being mental health is discussed um more than ever and awareness of it is on the rise yeah and i'm sure that if we were all just to slow down a bit more and take that time in our day not to be in such a rush and, mm. and eat and drink on the go but to actually just slow down our pace of life the mental well-being benefits from that as well could be huge so it's for us about how do we get sort of broaden this picture and i guess for 10 years we've been pretty like head down focused on our own thing in in the cup world but actually now when you you look around you realize there's a big movement of people all saying the same sort of thing so we're we're teaming up with organizations like one percent for the planet where 
um, one percent of our revenue is donated to biodiversity and sustainability projects and yeah. looking at other companies in that network looking at the other b corporations um speaking to people like zero waste scotland about the work that they're doing and understanding is there the learnings that we've had over the years that have driven behavioral change that they could benefit and apply more broadly so now a lot of what our future holds is that sort of collaborative approach in, in sh and knowledge yeah sharing. yeah i feel like you know that kind of jobs to be done theory could be applied to recycling in general because fuck lord knows that so many people manage to cock it up like yeah. even in our like you know we we share offices but there's people that clearly put in plastic tubs which aren't recyclable mm. at all never mind it's not like we've they, they were aiming for the plastic bin and it's ended up in the food waste bin it's like no you shouldn't be putting it in the plastic bin never mind the food waste bin yeah but no matter like you know the green team at signal are absolutely awesome guys in terms of doing education about it and uh signage and all this kind of stuff but there's still people that just it's like they just don't give a shit or you know whatever it may be they're just so ignorant to it yeah um and it's just so aggravating like, oh and it, yeah it's i've heard some crazy things i mean we were chatting to um like so a huge part of our business is working with businesses and corporates because they have such opportunity to switch off um, single-use items overnight so if you're a huge office block and you've got only disposable cups being served in your cafe you can take them away tomorrow and offer everyone a reusable if they want to yeah drink. so we do a, a massive part of our business is working with organizations like that and some of the funny stories i've heard um we were chatting to uh deloitte and they were saying that in their swiss office they took away um bins from under people's desks and yeah. in protest people were putting making garbage piles on the end of the desk saying you've taken away my right to a rubbish bin so now i'm just going to pile it on the I desk think I, like, like... I could be wrong <laughs> i could have completely maybe just made this up but i think in scotland you're not allowed yeah, it has to be recycled at source now so you're not allowed to have bins underneath desks right um it wouldn't surprise me because it could you, be wrong about that, but I, I think that obviously tons of people still do it which yeah. is like it's great having that law but who's really enforcing that law if there's yeah. not somebody who's passionate about it at your business uh but these but, businesses can also so if you're particularly if you're a big corporate that's got a thousand or you know ten thousand staff in one building you can have so much influence on the local community as yeah. well so if you um something really simple like coffee cups reusable cups we know what they are now but lunch boxes if you went to the um so I've, I've been i've looked in like the london bridge area for yeah. instance there's a lot of big office blocks and there's a lot of those people at lunchtime they're all going to those same takeaway chains yeah if you went and spoke to those chains and said we would like our staff to be able to use their own lunch boxes here we're going to issue them all with a relatively standard form mm. will you commit that you will you'll serve in these like and then it, and it's not a hygiene issue or you know and you could if you said to them yeah you, there's going to be a thousand staff coming from our office block in the in the week yeah yeah they would do it yeah so business has a lot of power I never thought about to that, change actually. it's funny like if you go in and get like a sandwich or a salad or whatever it may be yeah why wouldn't you take your own lunchbox and we get a lot of people apply to work for us that say i want to work somewhere where i feel like i can make a difference and partly like i think why can't you make a difference where you are like that example if there's something you're passionate about can you not apply that into your existing business if it is about reducing waste can you set up the green team or can yeah. you go and speak to the local cafes and see if you can get them on board and get a discount for your staff if they bring their lunchbox so i think people who are passionate can change their businesses and ultimately i think business probably still has the largest part to play in behavioral change anyway yeah. because that's where people spend the bulk of their time but ultimately business is driving the economy as well yeah, yeah. so that that speaks very loudly um to shift in legislation legislation will help but if the business is pushing in that sure, direction yeah. too it will make legislation happen quicker yeah absolutely like I'll, you know they're maybe not got it cracked yet but but more and more coffee shops like obviously the independence definitely but even some of the high street businesses like i know that pret are on board with giving like a discount for a reusable cup and incentivizing you to bring your own reusable cup in 
um like you, maybe you can or cannot answer this question but like do they feel threatened almost by a company like yourselves like keep cup or do they genuinely want to kind of come to a collaborative partnership um because um, like if they, like you know for instance if everyone's kind of bringing in because they're a, a lot of their solution to the problem is like they just have their own branded prep thermos or you know prep yeah. reusable cup but they obviously nobody wants to forever carry around a prep cup they want to like put the good thing about key cups you can make them obviously your own personality your own colors your yeah. own style all this kind of stuff like that's what they want so do they kind of feel a bit threatened by you guys or i don't know i feel like the problem with major chains and and we work with a number of them um certainly when you look at our global footprint we work with most of them in one market or another mm. um and the and a lot of them are making substantial um savings on disposable cups now through through offering either a discount or starbucks now in the uk do a, um, i don't know if they do it nationally but in some places do a 5p tax on the cup prep do a big saving 50p discount i think we work with nero they do two stamps if you get one in the reusable so this is all making okay. a difference i think actually where they're letting themselves down or letting where they're, they're still trying so hard to preserve their status quo and there's that is that they their business model is so fundamentally reliant on takeaway coffee so when the latte levy came out in the press right at the start of 2018 almost days it may even been the next day i don't know there was a huge article front page news about how much money um costa were investing into recycling paper cups and it's like that smoke and mirrors tactic is irresponsible because they're saying we're going to invest money into recycling making a paper cup recyclable i would prefer that they hold their hand up and say yes it is a wasteful item the absolute best thing you can do is reuse yeah. actually sorry the best thing you can do is we're going to install dishwashers into our cafes again it's going to cost us money but then you're everywhere will have the option of sitting in first mm. then if you can't sit in use a reusable and as a last resort we're going to invest into better recycling facilities mm. but to come out and say recycling is the answer is irresponsible yeah because, yeah um, and there is a bit of that that sort of goes on in the industry still and, and that is a fear because there is so much reliance on on the takeaway industry but i think if we talk about reduce reuse recycle this is something that's taught in school as to how you reduce waste first reduce your waste then reuse where you can last resort is recycle. should be recycle and there's so much attention particularly in the cup space amongst the major chains at the moment on we're going to make our cups recyclable and that is the average consumer will look at that and go, oh, phew, they're solving yeah, it. Yeah, I'm doing my bit. Yeah, and they're probably it's put not it in a general now. waste public bin, which makes it completely pointless. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That's the other thing. It's it's that shorthand again, right? Yeah. Paper cups are recyclable. You don't read beneath that headline to the specific yeah. requirements required to do it. You just think, oh, that's great. I'll chuck it in the paper bin. Yeah. So that's where they could be doing more is just take more ownership of the challenge we're not it, i don't i don't think society expects everyone to solve problems overnight but i think just owning the problem being transparent right that's this responsibility sure. piece let's be transparent about the issues so that we can try and solve them quicker together mm. yeah absolutely um i know you mentioned they're working with cafe nero and i know you guys have been working with cafe nero uh, read a bit on linkedin that you'd put about that is it difficult to kind of get these businesses on board or are they eager to kind of help or is it just very between business to business you know, um to be fair they they are they're all open to talking about it um and it's been great working with nero uh they've rolled out our products across the whole country um and where when they first rolled them out there was great uptake. What I've learned through working with them is how the consumers got such a short attention span. So when we first launched the products, loads of people were buying them. Reuse rates were coming up really quick. We haven't done a lot in changing how the point of sale works. Right. Okay. And it's now just sort of, it's like it's part of the, um, uh, you know, it's part of the background noise now. Yeah. You, it's, you need to change the, 
the color of it or the position of it to make it stand yeah, out again. Yeah, have blindness to it because they yeah. see it all the time. But um, there's no one that's not doing something in that space. It's just not their number one priority. priority. If you were shifting your message on a daily basis, you could drive reuse rates up much more quickly. And we've got cafes, this um, cafe in Scotland called Wildcat, and they're at 100% um, uh, disposable free. And wow. they've just taken bold moves, but they've really committed to... Sure. And they've got the time and energy to to keep shifting and they do a really good fun thing which i would encourage others to do which is um a mug wall where they get people to donate mugs they don't need so if you forgot to bring your reusable cup you can just borrow a ceramic mug or something off the wall and it's just really quirky right. you have all these different mugs you've got way too many mugs at home right yeah so you yeah could donate a few and to... in the office yeah there's like all these mugs that people that have come in and then left yeah and then this is like it's great they have all these hooks and you just hang the mug up there and then oh yeah. wow that's brilliant what kind of number? I mean, do you do you have numbers off the top of your head in terms of like what Keep Cup are dealing with in terms of you know stopping people from using single oh, wow. use cups? I do, and um, but not off the top of my head. Um, I mean, uh, you know, the numbers escaping me. It's something like every year, um, it's something like five billion disposable cups being just. Dis- we estimate because if you just look at what we've sold over the decade yeah, that we've been course. going and if everyone is still at least semi-regularly using that there's billions of cups being saved just through yeah through that alone it must this be it must be scary when you actually hear the numbers of how many single-use cups get used on a daily basis because even like when you walk into some of these kind of especially the bigger chains and they've literally got like Towers of cups that are taller than me. Not that that's a massive challenge, yeah. but like <laughs> towers of cups that are bigger than me. And you're like, I guarantee that gets filled like three times a day, that tower, you know? But- this is that transparency thing as well. Um, I was just chatting to someone literally just yesterday about um, about this with um, festivals. Could, so we're not sure if like music festivals would be a good yeah. way of like promoting awareness or not. But anyway, the conversation that came up was it's now expected in everyday life and at festivals that your waste just disappears all the time so uh a million cups may get used in a day somewhere but you don't know what that looks like because they they've disappeared so far yeah that you never see this waste and that if you can just make that transparent for people and i'm not you know we don't want to do like necessarily gimmicky things where you slap them all in a bus and drive around london but yeah. we've become so used to waste disappearing almost as quickly as we yeah, deposited yeah. it that we I can't don't remember see what it. festival it was but i remember reading could have been tea in the park years ago and up in scotland but it takes them two weeks to clear the site right. of waste and litter that have been left behind two weeks of people working just to clear the waste from the site Jeez. and it's just like if people knew that or they saw you know uh the, like they put it on a big pile just take a photo of it yeah. and throw it up on twitter or something like this like if people saw it yeah like and that's certainly changing now that the mm. even it's amazing what even a show like blue planet two uh, with um, david ashton yeah. presenting you know this what humans are doing to the planet yeah, yeah the effect that that can have on social conscience but we do we've got such short attention spans we need to keep being reminded and sort of having this information put back in front of us otherwise um i I think of it as like the power of denial if you get up in the morning but and you listen to like the positive news and put on your favorite music like if you only focused on the bad news you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning yeah yeah and (laughs) humans live in this like state of denial generally where they focus on the positives because otherwise um it's gonna be a miserable existence (laughs) right just to kind of wrap up, we've got a couple of listener questions sure. uh, to ask you. Um, so the first listener question is from Jonathan in Glasgow, who has asked, I love Keep Cup, brackets, I own three, but I'd love to see a collapsible cup that could fit in my back pocket. Then you can take all my money. That isn't a question, but I like the enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, our Keep Cup looking at developing kind of new kind of ideas things like that so collapsible cup yeah collapses so there are a couple out there on the market we don't do a collapsible one um so and so there for jonathan was mm. it jonathan? yeah yeah, yeah jonathan. So, you know there are a couple out there i won't name names but uh because they're the competition but <laughs> no but ultimately that 
that's not a particular product that we're investing into for various reasons to do with how it works for the cafe in particular. Yeah, um, I can imagine it'd be pretty flimsy. Yeah, and it's so from one of the things that we try and do as well is is uh, it's it's also important that the coffee drinking experience is important to us. Yeah. So I understand those sort of challenges from a portability point of view, but when it actually comes to drinking and enjoying the coffee, it has other limitations. That said, you know, there's different products for different people. What we're looking at, um, so we are still innovating. We've got some more products coming to market quite soon, actually. Um, and one of those is uh, a new double wall product where, um, with stainless steel so it's a new material uh, for us cool but it will keep your product hotter for longer which is answering a question that quite a few people have come to us over the years yeah um we're also looking at our, can we develop products that continue so we're very focused on the beverage space mainly hot beverages obviously we've not we never ventured into water bottles because there's so many already on the market. Right. But we are looking at how do we keep evolving to the way people drink on the go? And if there's a beverage trend, how do we evolve to facilitate that? Yeah, of course. All right, cool. Uh, and then second question is from, excuse me, Jack in Bristol, who asks, do you think we will ever see an outright ban on single-use plastic cups in retailers? I think we will. I don't know if you see a I think we will see an outright ban on single-use items in general. Um, and it will probably start with a small group of really unnecessary single-use items and then continue to expand. Right. Um, I think we're more likely to see a tax come right. first. Yeah, because like, I suppose banning single-use cups, for example... Mm. Like all they would need to really do to kind of counteract that is, oh well, our cups are now compostable. Yeah, or so but like they'll, still they'll, they'll be there'll be some loophole yeah. for them to get kind of get out of it. It's kind of, pardon me, you're kind of stopping the wrong problem. Like like you're going back to the same theory. It's just yeah. like no, it's like about trying to make them more responsible, not just thinking about the like singularity of that single use plastic cup. Yeah. It's just like also what about their napkins and then their disposable forks and knives and their stirrers and you know, like the bigger picture. And there's some items, I think you're, some items you could ban now. Like I don't, I'm struggling to think of a reason why you couldn't ban um, plastic straws, why you couldn't ban plastic stirrers. Like there's certain single use items where this is completely unnecessary. Yeah. And there's already suitable replacements. Um, the you challenge. see a lot of retailers now kind of like and bars and stuff starting with the straws yeah because like when you think about that like you know i know nando's do it like nando's don't uh because i'm a massive nando's fan <laughs> but uh, i know like nando's like if you want a straw you have to ask for one yes but like and you literally have to ask and they will not say would you like a straw no it's you like, have to go out yeah way and, and it's like a, it's, 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 like you know and then since then i can imagine the number of straws they've probably it's a cost saving for them in terms yeah. of purchasing the the bloody things but also the impact that will probably have across our business because there's almost a nando's in every corner of yeah each big city yeah. these days you true. know yeah. like uh, it's crazy so no i think bans will come but unfortunately the bans will only happen i say unfortunately because it could shift things so quickly as society we're really innovative and we will come up with new solutions mm. but unfortunately it will only happen at a point where banning that item is not going to have such an adverse economic effect on on another business that it you know that it endangers jobs and, yeah and that's just the state of the reality at the moment but i think taxes will come first and then bans will follow yeah awesome well chris it's been an absolute pleasure thank having you. you on the show thank you for coming in i really do appreciate it and uh everyone by all means go to keepcup.com go and buy your keep cup if you don't have one already uh or get one from your local barista shop, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, but to wrap up, folks, please head over to the website, the mitmpodcast.com, and find out more about the show. You can head over to your favorite podcast platform, hit the subscribe button. That'll make sure you get notified when a new episode goes up. If you are enjoying the show, please help us out in some way, shape, or form. Hit the stars, leave a review, share it on Twitter or wherever you are, uh, and share it with your friends. And... By all means, please get in touch. The listener questions are lots of fun for myself and the guests to kind of read and kind of go through. But if you just have a comment or feedback or whatever it may be, get in touch. Send an email on 
method in the madness podcast at gmail.com send a dm on twitter or message on linkedin or whatever it may be but by all means don't be shy but thank you very much chris it's been awesome thanks gregor no that's it from us here thank you very much for listening and i hope you found some method in the madness